About two years ago, I designed and built one of my absolute favorite pieces of shop furniture, what I call the versatile workbench. And sometimes YouTube videos can lead you to believe everything goes perfect, but let me assure you, they do not. Was it worth the struggle or did I just waste my time? I'll let uh, you be the judge. This video is sponsored by Shopify. So I've personally found that a really good way to make shop furniture like big workbenches is to create a sort of frame and then build on top of that. So the first thing we need to do is cut down our pieces to size, glue up our laminations, and then do a little bit of optional post-processing. Here is a really good example of how useful a stop block can be when you're batching out parts. I made a little mark here on the end to help align both pieces. It just really needs to be close. We'll end up trimming these down later. Now instead of busting out 2,000 clamps and making a predictable clamp joke, I'm just gonna add some screws evenly distributed down the length to hold this lamination together while the glue dries. Now you could take these screws out afterwards, but I actually left them in for some added strength. All right, with the glue dried on the laminations, now we need to mill them down to their final size. But we also need to shave off the rounded edges on each side of the two by fours. But I recently purchased a little six inch joiner, which I don't know if that makes me a woodworker now, but I'm gonna use the little joiner to clean up the edges of these big laminations. Now this being a tabletop joiner and it's a six inch joiner, it might be kind of difficult considering the longest piece is about six feet long, but we'll give it a shot. So all of you fine woodworkers out there are probably cringing right now as you watch this plywood worker attempt to use a joiner. But hey, it actually worked out pretty well for this application. I set the cut depth to 1 16th and made two passes per side. That allowed me to sneak up on my final dimension of 3.25 inches. This was by far the sketchiest part. Can't say I would recommend doing this, but hey, like I said, it worked. And by the way, really happy with the dust collection on this thing. I mean, I barely found any shavings when I was done. You know what they say, clean shop is a clean mind. Ah, I forgot. So this is why I left all of those pieces long. Now I can trim them all down to exact size. So I started by driving one screw in at each corner just to keep the frame together and then got it perfectly square and drove in a total of five screws at each joint to really lock it in. So if you notice, there's actually no screws visible from one whole side. While those dry, I'm going to prep all of the stretchers and braces needed for the workbench. Most of these are held in place with pocket hole screws and then they're milled down to the same 3.25 inch height. Yeah, at this point I just totally gave up even trying with dust collection. Lastly, just cutting out a couple of panels before we actually start assembly. All right, so with all of the prep and milling done, we can now get to assembly. But first, I wanna clean up the lap joints on all four corners of each side of the frame. This will make sure we don't have any high spots and the top will sit nice and flush on the workbench.
Okay, here is where a big ass clamp comes in handy. I went out and bought a couple of these 48 inch clamps and it made my life so much easier. We all know pocket hole screws tend to shift your work pieces as you're driving them in, so clamping really helps prevent that. So for casters, I'm gonna use a little bit different design than previous workbenches and they're these little machine casters with a retractable foot. You turn this wheel, which lowers the foot and raises the table up off the wheel. These things are stupid strong and rated for a combined 2,200 pounds. Pretty sure my table will break well before the casters. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I spent a ton of time designing this thing, which is probably why it looks like it's an odd order for assembly. There is a plan, I promise. And if you ever wondered how professionals manhandle full sheets of three quarter inch plywood, it is exactly not like that. So I wanna clear up a couple things about these casters. So the first question was, are these casters supported by just two pocket hole screws? No. Now what I didn't show in part one was the addition of these caster blocks, which are at each corner of the workbench, which help to support those casters. These are held in place with screws and glue, so they ain't going anywhere. Also something that may not have been clear in the first video is that these bottom stretchers are tied into this end panel, which is then tied into the top stretcher for that much more strength. So short answer is no, these are not just supported by two pocket hole screws. The second comment was, why didn't you just mount the casters underneath the frame itself? Wouldn't that be much stronger? And the answer is yes, of course it would, but I'd be sacrificing a lot of vertical space that I wanna take advantage of inside the workbench. And lastly, number three, a lot of people thought these casters were cool, but some were commenting that those look hard to adjust when you're engaging and disengaging. And the short answer is, yeah, it's harder than like a locking caster. But for me personally, I don't really plan on moving this bench. And one of the biggest benefits of casters like this is they are much more stable than something like a locking caster. Hope that helps. All right, and so in part one, we left off by dragging this three quarter inch sheet of MDF up on top of the workbench frame. Obviously I have more plans than just laying a sheet on top of a frame. So the first thing that we're gonna do is create this lamination that's gonna eventually be the top itself. The lamination consists of a sheet of three quarter inch MDF bonded to a half inch sheet of plywood, which not only makes the top very stiff, but also preserves strength after we eventually route out channels for things like T-Track later. Now instead of clamps and sitting every conceivable heavy object I own on top of this thing while it dries, I'm just gonna use screws as clamps. A wide pan head screw works perfect here. Just make sure it obviously doesn't go all the way through. All of these screws will be removed later. 
All right, so while that glue is drying, I'm gonna work on how to fasten the top to the workbench itself. Now in previous workbench builds, I just countersunk and drove screws straight through the top. And honestly, that method is totally okay. It's actually the easiest way to do it, but because I'm trying to go that little extra mile on this build, I'm going to try and hide the fasteners as much as I can. So for that reason, I'm gonna use these little figure eight bracket thingamajigs, which will fasten to the frame like this, and then drive a screw in from the underside into the bottom of the work surface. Now these things are most commonly used on regular furniture, not shop furniture. And with that comes a little caveat that these are not very strong. So if you try and lift up this workbench by the top, you are definitely going to break something. But since this thing is gonna weigh a lot and I don't plan on doing that, these are a totally fine way to do it. You just need to go down deep enough here so they sit flush with the top of the frame. So with it being really cold outside, the top is still drying, that glue is not quite set up yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the different parts of the workbench. This is one of the good things about this design is that you don't really have to do it in order per se, and you can customize it however you want. So I need to cut a bunch of parts in half inch and three quarter inch plywood. And since I don't have my table saw yet, I'm gonna do it all with the Craig track saw on top of my drying workbench. So I went ahead and used my compact workbench with the Craig ACS, which is super handy for one-offs like this, especially if you don't have a table saw yet. So pro tip, follow the plans and lay out and install your drawer slides before assembly. So much easier. As we start to assemble the organizer bin insert, I'm using brad nails to keep it shape before eventually adding screws. Psst, did you know that there's full color plans available in metric two? I know, check the video description. Okay, bye. Okay, let's play a little game, and we see who can spot what I have wrong here. Do you see it yet? Do the location of the center drawer slides look a little off to you? Travis sudden screw up realization in three, two, one. Thank God I only put one screw in and the glue hadn't set up yet. It's so easy to make a mistake like that, especially when you're in the zone. The back panel adds a ton of strength, plus helps square up the cabinet. A Little bit of light clamp pressure across the diagonal was just the right amount of persuasion. Okay, so with the organizer insert cabinet set in place, it can actually be secured to the workbench via some screws down into the frame. But I'm actually gonna hold off on doing that for right now. In the meantime, I'm gonna finish up the top, which has now had 48 hours to dry. Turns out that Midwestern winter days in an unheated garage tends to make glue not dry very fast, which means I'm gonna have to heat it at some point. So all that's left to do is remove the screws that were temporarily clamping the two pieces in place while the glue dried. And then I'm gonna use a hardwood trim around these edges just so you don't see this exposed side of the plywood and the MDF. Plus it should add a lot of strength so that as I bump into it, I'm not gonna ruin it. Now you can use whatever wood you want here. I would recommend a hardwood. I'm gonna use maple and that's because I like bacon. Right, with all the screws removed, we can now flip over the top. Now don't feel like you need to miter these joints here. A simple butt joint works perfectly fine too. I just felt the eyes of YouTube watching me. Interestingly enough, this hardwood is uh, hard. The brad nails wouldn't even go all the way in, even with a hammer. So I ended up removing as much as I could 
and then pre-drilling and using finished screws instead. One major consideration here is if you do plan on adding T-Track to the top, mark out the approximate locations where you're gonna put that track so you can avoid putting things like screws and brad nails in those spots. Your router and your wrist will probably thank you later. And because I don't have my table saw, the bottom edge of these trim pieces is proud of the bottom of the work surface and thus has a small lip. So I thought, hey, why don't I use my flush trim bit like all those fancy woodworkers use? Okay, looks good so far. And disaster. The stupid little bearing broke off the bit about halfway through. Now what? I don't even wanna talk about it. Instead of having to do that all the way around the bench, I decided to instead just notch out the spots for the frame. Live and you learn. Then it's just attaching with screws from underneath into those hidden fasteners. The little guy, rightly so, thought that I needed maybe a little bit of help. Last step is just to clean things up and add a small chamfer around the top edge. Okay, so with all the top issues out of the way, the top sanded, the edges chamfered, it looking real nice, I'm gonna cut a big hole in it because at this point, I'm gonna mount my router lift into the table itself. Oh boy. I mean, at least nothing has gone wrong up to this point, so. Got that going for me. For my build, I'm gonna use this Craig Precision Router Lift. There's obviously a bunch of options out there, but in my opinion, the Craig is probably the best bang for the buck. So depending on whatever lift you're using, that is obviously the instructions you wanna follow when it comes to mounting in the surface itself. Once we get the lift set in place, we're then gonna build the dust collection box that mounts underneath. You know these cool, super detailed plans that I keep talking about? Well, I sell them online on my store that I built using Shopify. Now we've all sat through ads for website building tools, right? Well, this isn't one of them. Shopify is different because it's used for building online businesses first. It's a commerce tool. And frankly, it doesn't matter what you're selling either. Nowadays, it's important to have a web presence, even if you're only selling in person or locally. With Shopify, you can completely customize your online store to sell how you do business. And the cool part is that it can grow with you. Maybe you're selling handmade goods at craft shows today, but with Shopify, you can expand to world domination later. And speaking of global domination, they actually make that easier than ever with their new Markets Pro feature, which takes all of the guesswork out of collecting and remitting international taxes and duties. This lets you focus on what you do best, selling. And because Shopify is so popular, it integrates with all of the most popular apps and platforms, making expanding your reach really easy. So quit pondering that online store you've been thinking about forever. Start today with a free trial by heading to shopify.com shopnation. Or you can scan this QR code or head down to the link in the video description. Whew. Okay, back to the bench. Now moving on to the dust collection box for the lift. You don't actually need this little strange shape here. I had a brain fart and thought I did. Could be the COVID dust, I don't know. Now making a front access door that I'll attach with some small magnets. I took the time to double check I had the correct polarity for the corresponding magnet in the box frame itself. And don't you just love it when a plan comes to, comes to get, son of a, 
Luckily, once again, the glue wasn't fully set and I could flip the magnet to the correct side. So here I'm attaching a flange to the top of the box to help with mounting. All right, so our router desk collection box is almost done. There's a couple things I wanna do that I'm gonna call optional at this point. The first one is I'm gonna seal up the box as good as I can with some silicone caulking. Hopefully this helps, if anything, just make that dust collection a little bit better. And then I'm also gonna add some small ramps to kind of funnel the dust down into the hole of the blast gate. Again, not totally necessary, but I think it should help, if anything, just divert that dust down and out of the dust collection box. And then before I mount the box from underneath, I'm actually gonna put a strip of foam window seal around the top, again, just to try and seal up the box as best as I can. So now that we've got the box sealed up exactly like we want, we now need to poke holes in it. Huh? Yes, hear me out. For this dust collection to work properly, you need to have an actual air flow coming from around the router bit that's creating all the dust down through the bottom and out through to the dust collector. If everything is sealed up really tightly and the only opening is around the router bit at the top of the lift, chances are the dust collection is actually not gonna be that good. So what you actually wanna do is introduce controlled flow of air to help get that dust moving down and out of the dust collection box. So there's a couple ways to do this. What I'm gonna do is actually just drill some holes into this removable door here. You could also put something like a barbecue vent, like a variable damper, and you can adjust it. What I'm gonna do is drill a couple holes, do some testing, drill some more holes, until I really hit that sweet spot. But you can do it however you want. Now once we're done with the router lift and the dust collection box for the lift, and then we're gonna move back over to the organizer insert, get that put in place, and get all the drawers mounted. I'll tell you what would have been really great if I followed my own plans and cut this hole before mounting it underneath the workbench. This will accept a two inch desk grommet so the router power cord can feed through it. Now I'll say it again, one of the nice things about these plans is that you can really do it in whatever order you want or what works best for you. So I think I'm gonna start by building the drawer insert and the router table insert that goes inside, but not quite put them in the workbench yet. I wanna make sure we have enough room to put all the electrical and dust collection connections and components inside the workbench. So using the handy dandy cut sheets and my brand new table saw, we'll break down some plywood. Back to having a table saw and it is awesome. You'll notice I'm still using my track saw to break down the sheets though. I'm starting to think this hybrid approach is pretty good. Also worth noting that I don't have any kind of dust collection hooked up to the saw yet, so kinda messy. So with all of the pieces for the carcass cut out, now I can just assemble the box in preparation for installing the drawers. But before I do that, like we did on the organizer insert, I'm going to install the drawer slides prior to putting the box together. 
This just makes your life a little bit easier with a little bit of forethought. First, marking the top and bottom edges for reference. This is a habit I've gotten into that has helped me avoid a lot of mistakes during assembly. Not all, but a lot. So you'll see the same basic steps here during assembly of the different inserts. First, glue and brad nails to keep everything in rough shape. Then I'll come back and reinforce all the joints with countersunk screws. I thought I'd throw some clamps on here for good measure while I pre-drill and drive in the screws. Then finally adding the back, which is really gonna add a lot of strength and rigidity to this insert box. And because I'm following these ridiculously awesome plans, everything should fit just perfect, uh, perfect. After some serious life contemplation, I finally figured out that I actually put the vertical support in the wrong spot. Had I followed the plans correctly, there wouldn't be an issue. Okay, so with the carcass of the drawer insert in place, now is a good time to stop and do the electrical and the dust collection system. Now we're gonna start with the electrical and I designed it to be as simple and user-friendly and approachable as possible. If you go back and watch my ultimate workbench build, there's quite a bit of wiring and I ended up getting a lot of questions about how I did particular things and I just really didn't feel comfortable answering them because I'm not an electrician at all. So for this build, I'm trying to keep it really simple. I'm using mostly off-the-shelf components. You don't need to do any wiring. And at the end, you're gonna have a workbench with auxiliary power on each side of the workbench, as well as a trigger for the dust collection system that sits in the dust collection cabinet. So for incoming power, I'm gonna use this really cool little plug that I think is used for marine applications. This is gonna sit on the other side of the workbench and you're gonna plug in an extension cord into this and the other end obviously goes into your wall. The idea here is that you don't have a cord attached to your workbench so as you're moving it around, you don't have this thing dangling that you need to keep track of. I've approached this problem a couple different ways. In the ultimate workbench, I did a fixed cord, which was nice because my bench in particular didn't move. In a compact workbench behind me, I used a cord reel, which is really a cool application, but because space was at a premium, I decided to go this route. With power coming into this plug, it's going to power this heavy duty surge protector. And from here, it's gonna power everything else on the bench. So again, really simple. It's literally just plug and play. And for the outlets on each end of the bench, there's gonna be one located on this side and one located on the far side. I'm just gonna use these sort of flush mount receptacles. These are rated for 12 amps. So most of the hand tools that you're gonna to use around this bench are perfectly fine to run through this. I will note, you do not wanna run something like a table saw through these because your table saw, as it starts up or is in a heavy cut, is gonna draw probably more than 12 amps. So I plan on plugging my table saw in directly into the wall. So to get this stuff mounted, we just need to cut some holes, a rectangular hole for this reset power outlet, a circular hole for the incoming power, and then while we're at it, we'll cut the openings for the dust collection blast gates as well. This design allows almost exactly just enough room to squeeze all of this in, so it's important that if you change anything, double check that you're not creating a problem elsewhere. I love cheap tools. So glad I saved that 38 cents by going with a combo set of drivers and extensions, said no one ever. My son is absolutely obsessed with hand power tools. We ended up just leaving a circular saw in his crib to play with. I'm kidding, it was just a reciprocating saw. Jeez.
Okay, so now would be a good time to talk about the dust collection system that I've designed to put inside the workbench. Now, as you can tell, it's pretty compact. It is not a full-fledged dust collection system that you can expect to hook up to something like a table saw. For that, you need a much higher flow rate than something like this can generate. So the main intent of this dust collection system is to handle any of the hand tools that you're using around the workbench and the router table. Now, there is an argument to be made that it may not be quite enough to handle a router table, but better than nothing. So for the equipment, I have this small vacuum. It's a VacMaster Beast. I have no experience with it, never used it, but it has a small footprint and a pretty high output for its size. Paired with that to remove as many solids as possible is the trusty DustRite separator. Now I have used three of these in the past. This is number four for me. They've all worked really well. It's not perfect, but I like it because it's low profile, meaning I can fit it inside of shop furniture like a workbench. This little vacuum can only generate about 100 CFM or cubic feet per minute. When it comes to dust collection, flow rate is king. And to put that 100 CFM into perspective, a medium sized dust collection system that you'd hang on the wall will generate well over 1000 CFM. So they're literally 10 times as much as this little thing. But for sanders and jigsaws and routers and things that I'm gonna use around the table, I think this is gonna do just fine. And for the table saw, I finally broke down and bought a big boy dust collector, a wall mounted dust right blower capable of producing 1250 CFM of dust sucking action. I know I'm notorious for wanting to hide all of my dust collection, but I've come to the inevitable realization that if I want a clean shop, I need something like this. This thing really is a beast and pulls an impressive amount of air using the one and a half horsepower motor running on standard 110 volts. Okay, so back to the mini dust collection system on the workbench. Using some two and a half inch hose and a three machine fitting kit, which is linked in the description, the first thing I did was run the two and a half inch hose lines. It's a tight fit in some spots, which is why you wanna do this now rather than later. Next up is to simply add some mounting holes to the blast gates. Then just make all of the connections using the thumb screw clamps included in the three machine kit. Okay, so with the electrical and dust collection out of the way for the workbench, we're gonna move on to building the parts for the router table, as well as the drawers for the drawer insert that we built earlier. Basically, I'm just gonna be breaking down a lot of three quarter and half inch plywood on the table saw, but I get to use my new dust collection system, so we'll see how that goes. Well, I can say that the bigger dust collector makes one heck of a difference, that's for sure. That paired with the over the blade dust collection, and I really didn't see a whole heck of a lot of sawdust coming out of those cuts. You can see some on the top of the saw, but that's really it. Okay, so with all the ripping and cross cutting and cutting out of the way, you can see in front of me, I've got all the pieces for the router table insert. And also you've got all the pieces for the drawers for the drawer insert that we've already built. So now it's just a matter of putting it all together. Now where the hell did I put the glue?
Next up are the vertical pull-out drawers for the router bits. Now I'm going to make one pullout dedicated to half inch bits and the other for quarter inch bits. You can obviously customize your needs to do whatever you want here, but I really like how I utilize this space to make your bits easy to get to. And here you see me putting them in upside down. Nice, Travis. I realized my mistake and fixed it later. Not a big deal. This one slides in perfectly with the designed quarter inch to spare. Okay, now on to the drawers for the drawer insert. This drawer design is exactly the same one I used for all 20 of my drawers for the ultimate cabinets you see behind me. I've come to really like them as a good compromise of strength and simplicity. There's a dado cut on the bottom of each side piece, which the bottom slides into. Then the bottom is screwed into the bottom of the front and back pieces. For large or wide drawers, I found this design really helps prevent that bottom panel from bowing, especially when you load it up with heavy stuff. And luckily I just need to make four drawers, two of each size for this workbench, not 20 drawers of eight different sizes like the Ultimate Cabinets. Now there are many ways to seal MDF, but the important thing is that you do in fact seal it. I think I like shellac best because it dries relatively quickly and with three coats makes a really hard and protected surface. I would recommend doing a light sanding between coats with something like 320 grit sandpaper. Okay, so with the top looking really nice, now we just need to route some channels in it. Yeah, we gotta mess it up. Now obviously you can route the channels first and then apply finish. I just thought it might be faster to do beforehand. Once I route the channels, I think I'm gonna apply probably one coat of shellac inside the channels just to protect them just a little bit. But regardless of whichever way you choose to do it, this is absolutely one of those nerve wracking moments. Just like cutting the opening for the router lift, pucker factor is high. Let's just get it over with. It'll be good. It'll be good. It'll, it'll be good. Yep, it'll be good. Anytime you're routing channels like this for T-Track, do yourself a favor and do a test on a scrap piece of material just to check overall fit. I'm trying to dial in the depth here more than anything. I want the T-Track to sit just below the surface. So that's a good sound, right? That's what it's supposed to sound like. Then to add insult to injury, I accidentally toss my mask right into my dust collector. When it rains, it pours. Blowout, uh, 
blows. What I should have done was used a sacrificial board to act as a backer to prevent this. Now a cool way to do that when clamping is tough, like on the edges of a workbench, is to use a blue painter's tape between the backing board and the workpiece. Then use some CA glue and some accelerant, if you've got some, to securely hold it in place. All right, so with the issue behind us and no possibility of more issues, we can continue. Son of a bitch. Remember when I said to make sure you mark out where your T-Track is going when using screws or brad nails on the top? After a quick check that there were no more screws in the way, we can carry on. Here you can see way better result with no blowout. I was actually pleasantly shocked by how well this worked. Removing this little backing board is pretty easy. Usually you didn't even need to use any tools. Now for the longer runs, I had to get creative with my straight edge setup since I don't have an edge guide for my router. And surprisingly, the rest of the channels were trouble free. So as you can see, I've got all the T-Track installed except for this intersection. I ordered it and I can't really find it, so I have to order another one. But it actually allows me to point out something you can do, especially if you're incorporating a lot of T-Track into your table, and that's actually leave the intersections out. This lets you add or remove T-Track accessories pretty easily instead of having to go into the edge of the table and dragging it all the way to the center. So because all my T-Track is sort of around the outside of my table, this is less important for me, and I'm going to put the intersection in. But if you had a bunch of T-Track, it's an idea that might make your life a little easier. And with the top finished and out of the way, we can move on to the face frame, the doors, and the drawer fronts. Using the measurements from the plans, we'll go ahead and cut that stuff out. All of the face frame pieces are glued and brad nailed in place individually. Now you can also assemble the face frame and then install, which would definitely give you a cleaner look, but to be honest, this weighs a lot quicker. Now this is designed so that there's a small gap at the top between the table frame and the face frame itself. This is to account for any small discrepancies and you won't see it once it's all assembled. Now for the doors and drawer fronts. The plans call for a flat design with a simple chamfer around the edges, but you can obviously do whatever door style you want here. Go nuts. I gotta be honest, I was pretty excited to finally use my new router lift. Turns out they're pretty damn handy. I obviously don't have a fence yet, which would have really helped with the dust collection, but honestly the downdraft dust collection actually did work pretty well, all things considered. Now marking the hole locations for the hardware. Okay. 
all the doors, the drawer fronts, everything's cut to size, everything's got a bevel around the top edge. Now comes the time where we have to mount them on the actual workbench. Now I know that this step can be a little nerve wracking for people because let's face it, if you mount everything crooked, that's what you look at. But especially when it comes to drawer fronts, it's actually pretty easy. And I use a method that I've shown in other videos, but I'll show it again here real quick. The first step is actually pre-drilling your hardware holes in your drawer front. I know this seems counterintuitive to some, but trust me, it'll make sense in a second. Next, you're gonna wanna position your drawer front using spacers or measurements. Once it's exactly where it needs to go, drive in two screws through the pre-drilled hardware holes into the drawer box behind it. I like to use a larger diameter pan head screw for this, just so you don't damage the holes that you've already drilled. Then simply open the drawer and drive in some screws from inside the drawer to secure the drawer front. Once that's done, close the drawer back up and remove the two screws you put in to clamp the drawer front in place. Now using those two holes you pre-drilled for the hardware, use those as guides to drill all the way through into the drawer box. And then finally, just mount your hardware. So you see, it's actually pretty simple. It's a lot more simple than people realize. There's of course, 1500 different ways to do it, but that's a method that I found to work really well. Now mounting cabinet doors can also be intimidating, but these are easy too. I'm using some European style half inch overlay hinges, which require a large mounting hole. Now there are jigs out there to make this even easier, but it's straightforward without them too. The correct tool for this job would be a self-centering drill bit, but mine just happened to be jammed, so I'm center punching them by hand. Now just add a spacer, in this case just below the door, and mount the hinges to the face frame. The great thing about this type of hinge is that they're really adjustable, so you can really fine tune the fit afterwards. Now I gotta admit, it looks pretty good. But as you know, like I said in the beginning of the video, I am gonna paint this thing, so the next step for me is to break it all back down and prep all the pieces for painting. This includes sanding any rough spots, filling voids like nail holes, and just getting the thing looking really nice. Once that's done, I'll transform this whole area into a paint booth and go to town with my handheld Graco sprayer. And don't worry, I'm not gonna bore you with all of that tedious stuff. I'll just show you some highlights.
Would you just look at it? I mean, come on, man. This thing looks freaking awesome. I am really stoked with how this thing turned out. And I'm even more stoked that now I have a workbench in my shop that I can just start using and stop building. Now I'll start by saying that this step is already in the workbench plan, so really there's no excuse as to why I haven't mounted this switch yet. Now I'm opting to mount this inside of the door versus on the outside like it's actually intended because, well, I think it looks better. And speaking of looks, I wanna hide that ugly wood edge. So I 3D printed the simple bezel to clean it up. It is all about those details. All right, we've got the switch mounted. Frankly, this is something I should have done a while ago. Now I can quickly shut it off should something go wrong during the next step, which is gonna be machining some aluminum on a woodworking router. Yeah, you uh, heard that right. I bought this angled aluminum piece that's gonna act as sort of the frame for this router fence we're gonna build. And in order to build it, I need to drill some holes, route some slots, and cut a big old opening in this thing. Now there's a lot of ways you can do this. Aluminum is fairly soft and you can cut with most woodworking tools. So I need to cut this thing down to length. I'm gonna do that on my miter saw. And I've been experimenting with some bits in my router table on what machines aluminum the best. And based on a little bit of testing that I've done, I've found that actually a conventional straight-sided router bit works really well. Just take little bites at a time, you'll be fine. But wear eye protection and be careful during this step if you choose to do this yourself. Now I was going back and forth on whether to buy a fence itself that works on my table and the T-Track I have. And ultimately I just decided to build one, but it's very similar to the ones that you can buy from all the big name brands that you know. So if you don't feel comfortable cutting this aluminum, buying one might be a pretty good option. The advantages to building it yourself, obviously, is you can customize it to look however you want. Now here's a good trick when you need to make precise marks on something like metal. First, use a Sharpie to fill in the areas that will be marked. This is gonna create a contrast for the next step, which is to scribe or score your marks using something sharp. The shiny exposed metal underneath the blue Sharpie will stand out making it easy to see. And always remember to center punch for holes. There is an actual gluing compound for doing this stuff, but if you don't have that, a Sharpie works great. Next is to quickly deburr the holes. and then countersink if necessary. Okay, so now the scary part. Be careful during this step and be prepared for disaster, AKA anticipate how it could go wrong and stay out of the way. The key is to go slow and make sure you're engaging the bit in the right direction. Mm. 
You'll notice I have two temporary fences set up for this. One's dedicated for the top of the slot, while the other is used for the bottom of the slot. This is so I'm always pushing the right way. Another cool trick I used is to use some temporary fixture blocks to hold the piece at 45 degrees so I can cut out the center opening on my bandsaw. I gotta say, it worked like a charm. Now it goes without saying that everything I'm using, including materials, tools, whatever, I will link down in the video description below, so go check that out if you're interested. All right, and with that, that wraps up the part I was most worried about in this project, and that is getting this piece of aluminum milled down to its final shape with all of the slots and holes and big opening cut in it. So overall, I am pretty dang happy with how this turned out. I will say it was mildly sketchy in parts, so if you're at all nervous about doing this, just skip this step and go buy a fence. But if you're up for a challenge, give it a shot. So with the aluminum piece complete, I just need to cut the stationary face and both movable faces that I'm attached to this frame. Now with my original plan, I was just gonna use plywood or maybe MDF, but because I have a sickness and I wanna take every project to the next level, I went with colored MDF. Now I bought this stuff online. This is extremely hard to find here in the US. I think in Europe, it's a lot easier to get your hands on. I'll put a link down at the supplier that I use, but you can buy it in either 18 inch by 18 inch or 24 inch by 24 inch sheets. And they have a ton of different thicknesses, including the most common varieties of three quarter inch and half inch. Adding this T-track on the top of the face is going to allow me to use something like a stop block in the future. So, what do you think? It seems like I come to the same revelation after every shop project like this, in that how did I live without this before? Just something as simple as having the power and e-stop on the outside of the table saves so much time and stress. But the biggest improvement by far goes to the router fence. And there are two big reasons. One is safety. I can now easily keep the items up against the fence and not have to worry about riding a bearing if there is one. And then also I can use things like feather boards to kind of wedge the piece down through there. Just makes it so much easier. But the second thing is dust collection. Holy crap. And I'm running the dust collection on the central vac that's located inside the workbench. If you wanna know how that whole system works out, go back and watch that build series. But basically there is dust collection down through the router lift cavity, as well as through this hose, which comes in through this auxiliary port here. So both of those are open when I'm running the router table and I basically have no dust. 
which is, it blows my mind because this is kind of a paradigm shift for me because every time I get out my router, I just assume that my entire workbench and workshop for that matter is gonna be covered in dust. This fixes that.